Hello and welcome to MIT Sloan Alumni Online. Every month, MIT Sloan Alumni Online brings you the latest breaking news, cutting edge research, groundbreaking ideas, and school updates from MIT Sloan faculty, alumni, and students. Today, we are honored to have Professor Andrew Lowe, Charles E. and Susan T. Harris Professor of Finance and the Director of the Laboratory for Financial Engineering. He received his PhD in economics from Harvard University, and before joining MIT's finance faculty in 1988, he taught at the Wharton School. He has published numerous articles in finance and economics journals and has authored several books, including his newest book, Adaptive Markets, Financial Evolution at the Speed of Thought. He is currently co-editor of the Annual Review of Financial Economics and an associate editor of the Financial Analyst Journal, the Journal of Portfolio Management, and the Journal of Computational Finance. There's so much more that I could say, but let's get to the reason that you have all joined us today. Professor Lowe, thank you for being here. I'll now turn it over to you. Well, I want to start by uh, thanking Betsy for that very generous introduction and the uh, MIT Office of External Relations for hosting this wonderful event. Uh, I'm really excited to be talking about my new book, Adaptive Markets, and I want to thank all of you who are watching. Uh, I have to say that this is a bit of a new format for me, so I'm not really sure quite how it'll work out. Um, I, uh, I'm, I'm, it's going to be a little bit more intimate, uh, but at the same time, a bit less interactive. I'm used to lecturing to uh, live audiences, students, and, and uh, colleagues. Uh, but I think that uh, this should be a, an interesting experiment, so I'm really keen to get your feedback. And so please send me um, your reactions uh, afterwards. Um, I thought I'd, what I'd like to do to begin is to give you a little bit of background about uh, the origins of this book and how I first came to start working on this idea of adaptive markets. And it has to do with uh, a comment that I overheard many years ago after I'd given a lecture in my introductory finance class on efficient markets. Apparently, one of the students uh, missed a class, and uh, so afterwards, as I was walking through the halls, I heard that student talking to another one of the students uh, who did come, and um, the uh, the student missed a class, asked his friend, uh, what did I miss? And uh, the uh, student said, oh, you didn't miss much, just more lies my finance professor told me. And at that point, I realized that you know not everybody believes in the efficient markets hypothesis the way that academics do, and uh, that's really what motivated me to start trying to understand what this kind of discrepancy was between what we teach our students and what we develop a series and what people from the real world actually believe. And so ultimately I decided to put all of the various different research projects that I come up with uh, into a book that could be accessible to a broad audience. And uh, I, um, I had a book contract with Princeton University Press. This must have been around the early 2000s, 2002, 2003, that I first uh, started putting all the pieces together. And around 2004 and 5, I thought I had enough for a book. So my book contract, uh, which I've displayed a portion of here, called for the delivery of the manuscript on April the 15th, 2008. Uh, obviously, I was a bit late, but uh, as you can imagine, there were a few interesting things that happened during that year. The financial crisis hit, and I started getting drawn into all sorts of research about the crisis, much of which actually is relevant to the idea of adaptive markets, and you'll read about in the book. The other thing I wanted to mention is that the book called for 80,000 words. And uh, for those of you who've uh, gotten a copy of the book, you know that it's quite a bit more than that. I think the book comes in at about 150,000, and uh, the publisher did reserve the right to reject the manuscript if uh, we went too far over that, but fortunately, they agreed. And I want to apologize for the length of the book and explain why it is so long. My publisher told me early on that for every mathematical equation that I include in the book, I can expect half the number of readers. And the book that I'd written previously from Princeton University Press, this non-random walk down Wall Street, had many, many pages that looked like this. So I think when you use that algorithm that my publisher proposed, uh, in the end, I probably had only one or two readers for the book. And I know that this book is not all that popular uh, in the general audience because my publisher decided a few years ago to make the book free. And so you can actually download the entire book online, which gives you a sense of just how valuable they think it is. 
so I decided that it would be a good idea to write a book without any equations. And of course, that's one of the reasons that the book is as long as it is. So um, I thought I would also tell you a little bit about the fact that the book was written as a kind of a personal journey. And so I thought I would tell you exactly you know, uh, how that really got going. It has to do with the fact that really we have this debate in finance between people who think the markets are efficient, that prices fully reflect all available information, and at the opposite end of the spectrum, people who believe that we all act irrationally. And so the kind of theories that finance academics uh, like to talk about regarding prices being fully um, a reflective of all available information, that can't possibly be true. And what I really wanted to do was to try to bridge that gap because, like many of you, I was brought up in the, in the efficient markets uh, camp, but quickly realized that there were a, a number of exceptions to this very important idea. And, you know, it's a little bit like uh, the situation when two parents are arguing. From the kid's perspective, you know, you love them both and you just wish they would stop arguing and get along. And so I'm very proud to say that the adaptive markets hypothesis. Uh, it allows both of those parents to come together in, in a very peaceful and loving relationship, and that it's really because when we take a look at the broader perspective of human behavior, you can show that both elements, the behavioral side as well as the rational side, uh, have a lot to offer us. What we, we need to have that kind of an overarching view to be able to make some uh, sense of it. So let me summarize the basic idea by saying that the traditional investment framework is flawed. It's not wrong, but it's broken in a very significant way. It's incomplete. Uh, and it's incomplete because it doesn't capture the fact that during stable periods, stable investment rules make sense and the efficient market hypothesis holds. But during unstable periods, when the economy and the market environment becomes highly dynamic, then the standard approaches don't work. And we really have to understand under what kinds of environmental conditions we're actually uh, in the midst of. So I would say that the current environment is highly dynamic. And as a result, the traditional investment rules and relationships don't hold today. And so we need to understand how to adapt to those changing market conditions. You know, a while ago, politicians came up with the phrase, it's the economy, stupid. I always thought that was kind of a rude statement, but I get the point that uh, people are driven by economic considerations. I think that biologists should start saying to economists, actually, it's the environment. The environment is really what dictates behavior. And what I'm going to show you and what the book is about is how to think about that kind of a, a framework for understanding behavior, especially when environments are changing rapidly. Now, as I said, this is going to be a bit of a personal journey. It took me a long time to figure this out. And I got to tell you that the journey was anything but a straight line. There are lots of little uh, digressions and uh, uh, various different uh, cul-de-sacs that I ended up at. Uh, so I'd like to just give you a very quick overview of what that journey looked like. It started, of course, with the efficient markets hypothesis and rational expectations. That's really what I was taught in graduate school. And I learned to respect and, and love this idea that prices fully reflect all available information, and that you could explain all sorts of phenomenon with very, very, very big, simple uh, uh, rules like uh, no arbitrage and uh, the law of one price. But then it's clear that all these exceptions started being documented about human behavior. And so that brought me to the field of behavioral finance and psychology, especially in some of my own research where I looked at data and I couldn't see the kinds of traditional relationships that um, the efficient markets hypothesis called for, things like the random walk hypothesis, which I'll talk about in a minute. Then the behavioral finance and psychology literature brought me to the cognitive neurosciences because I, was, I really wasn't satisfied with just knowing what these biases were. I wanted to know where they came from, and ultimately you have to go through the, the neuroscience literature to understand how behavior is related to brain activity. And that brought me to the ideas of artificial intelligence and bounded rationality, how we model human thought in some systematic ways. And ultimately, that brought me to evolutionary biology and ecology. And it was really only through all of these various different uh, uh, fields that I finally came to put it all together 
and uh, uh, came up with this notion of adaptive markets. Now, uh, what I'd like to do is, uh, since I can't take you through all of these different examples and fields, I want to just give you a few examples, and I'm going to do that in a rather general fashion because I know that there are a number of people on this webinar that don't have any finance background, and I don't want to assume. So I'm going to try to use non-finance examples. And to do that, I want to start by motivating the efficient markets hypothesis for those who really aren't familiar with it. It's really quite a remarkable and compelling idea. And I'm going to illustrate it with a terrible tragedy. On January the 28th, 1986, at exactly 11.39 a.m., the space shuttle Challenger took off from Cape Kennedy. And as it took off, about 73 seconds into the flight, it started breaking apart. And before our very eyes, the space shuttle and all of its crew disintegrated. This is a horrible event. And what made it worse was the fact that one of the passengers was a beloved New Hampshire school teacher, Krista McAuliffe. And at the time that this happened, all of the various different news sources tried to come up with some kind of a narrative for what was going on. And they asked a number of the vendors that provide, provided parts for the space shuttle what happened. But of course, there were no comments. Shortly after this event, President Reagan appointed the Rogers Commission which over the course of four and a half months interviewed hundreds of witnesses and engineers and scientists and manufacturers to try to come up with an explanation of what happened. This was a blue ribbon panel that contained a number of very notable individuals, including the great physicist Richard Feynman, who came up with an incredibly compelling demonstration of what the proximate cause was for this terrible tragedy. And those of you who have seen the YouTube videos of uh, uh, Professor Feynman know that it was this uh, infamous O-ring, this rubber ring that went around one of the joints of the booster rockets that apparently became brittle because the space shuttle was launched in freezing temperatures and that allowed vapors to escape and ultimately caused the booster rocket to explode mid-flight. Now, this took four and a half months for the commission to come up with this finding. And the question that a couple of economists asked in 2003 was, what did the market know and when did the market know about this particular incident? Now, specifically, what these two economists did was to ask the question of the four major vendors that built parts for the space shuttle, Lockheed, Martin Marietta, Rockwell International, and Morton Thiokol, the producer of that booster rocket that had the O-ring. These four companies all were publicly traded at the time. And so the question that these two economists, Michael Maloney and Harold Mulhern, asked was, what happened to the stock prices of these four companies, not four and a half months later when the Rogers Commission report was published, but what happened on the day of the explosion? And so what they did was to run a simulation and look backwards at the data for January the 28th, 1986, and they found something quite striking. Of the four companies that produced parts for the space shuttle, only one of these four companies had to uh, have a trading halt in their stock prices because there was so much trading activity that the New York Stock Exchange couldn't handle the flow. And that company was Martin Thiokol, the producer of the booster rocket. And they plotted the price paths of these four companies starting at 11.30 in the morning, right before the launch. And you'll notice from this graph that all four of these companies' stock prices got hit pretty hard in the minutes after the terrible tragedy. But three of them recovered to some degree. Only one of the companies actually had continued price declines. And that company was none other than Morton Thiokol. So it seems like within minutes, the stock market reacted. And within hours, the stock market figured out that Morton Thiokol was going to be hit hardest by this terrible event. And of course, Morton Thiokol, in fact, was hit very hard. Now, there are all sorts of explanations for what happened, why it happened, how it happened, and I'm not here to assign blame. But what's interesting about the stock market reaction is that almost instantaneously, the market figured out 
that the booster rocket at Morton Thiokol was going to be affected. That's the efficient markets hypothesis in a nutshell. Prices fully reflect all available information. It's what the uh, Wall Street Journal reporter and journalist James Sirwicky called the wisdom of crowds uh, in a book by the same name. His idea was that by looking at all sorts of different people engaged in trying to assess the value of this company, that somehow the combination of all of their efforts ultimately produces great wisdom. It's the uh, old story of the gate guessing game where you try to guess the number of beans in this jelly bean jar. Now, if any one of you tried to guess the number of beans, my guess is that your guess would be pretty far off. But if we took a bunch of you and averaged all of these different guesses, it turns out that that would actually be pretty close to the actual number of beans in the jar. This is an experiment that's been done many, many times. And it's really impressive when you have a room of 100 or 200 people and you try this out in real time. Now, economists have a very specific way of thinking about this, and uh, I'll show you what that is, but I uh, just want to mention that this is the one equation I'm going to show on my slide. I am from MIT, after all, so I've got to at least show one equation. And the equation is this. If you're trying to measure the value of the number of beans in the jar, and let's call that value X, but you guess at that value, and so your guess for individual I is XI, then it turns out that, uh, oh, sorry, um, my, uh, my shade here is uh, pulling up. Um, let me just close it. As you probably know, the Sloan School uh, is a very advanced, environmentally friendly building. We have all sorts of smart controls that I'll come back to in a minute because uh, sometimes these controls are smarter than uh, we would like them to be. In any case, uh, getting back to this equation, if we're each trying to come up with the value of x, but we're guessing, we don't know exactly what x is, so we make mistakes, and these mistakes are written as epsilon i, that individually we could be pretty far off from x, so xi, our guesses, can be far off, but when we average all of these guesses, then it turns out that the errors tend to average out, and so that's one of the reasons why the wisdom of crowds works. Now, this equation illustrates beautifully the two principles involved in this wisdom of crowds argument. And the two principles are, number one, you need a crowd. In other words, you have to have a large number of people trying to figure out the answer to this problem. So N, the number of people, has to be large. And the second thing you need is the crowd has to be wise. Now, what does that mean? In this context, it means that each of our individual guesses cannot be very strongly related to other people's guesses. Specifically, the mistakes that we make, these epsilons, they actually have to be statistically independent over time. So these con two conditions will generally lead to the wisdom of crowds. But there are exceptions. And the exceptions have to do with when, with when the, one of these two conditions fails. Now, Many people have challenged this notion of rationality as the wisdom of crowds. And the work that Craig McKinley and I did in the 1980s and 90s, where we tested one of those implications, the random walk hypothesis, clearly showed that the random walk, this idea that stock prices behave like a drunkard's walk and you can't predict them, that's clearly rejected by the data. You can predict to some degree. It's not easy, but it's possible to do. Separately, a number of psychologists and behavioral economists have documented all sorts of other behavioral biases. In fact, uh, one summer I went through that entire literature, and at the end of the summer, I was convinced that the human animal was the stupidest creature on earth because we all engage in these kinds of biases. But you probably didn't need a psychiatrist or a psychologist to tell you that we engage in these kinds of biases because the financial crisis was a pretty big illustration of the fact that the wisdom of the crowds can fail spectacularly. In fact, the source of the failure has to do with those two conditions that I just described about what you need for the wisdom of crowds. We certainly had a crowd and still do in financial markets, but what failed was that the crowd wasn't so wise. And specifically what I mean is that we all started thinking alike.
the errors, the epsilons that I showed you in that equation became correlated over a period of years, both on the way up and then on the way down. The wisdom of crowds, this notion of independence across these various different individuals was replaced by what I call the madness of mobs. And there are many examples in nature of mobs. Uh, a, herding, a herd of elephants stampeding is just one example. Now, that's not necessarily irrational because these kinds of stampedes can protect herds from predators, but they can have a number of very serious and unpleasant unintended consequences. And examples of the madness of mobs that really aren't as productive are, for example, the Crusades, uh, the Salem witch trials, or bank runs. The key factor in all of these madness of mobs examples is that adaptation, the way that people think and the way they make decisions, are greatly influenced by the environment, and sometimes adaptation can lead to those unintended consequences. So I'd like to give you a few examples, and the first has to do with a very old study. It was published in 1975 by Sam Peltzman, an economist at the University of Chicago. And this study has the rather boring sounding title, The Effects of Automobile Safety Regulation. But believe me, this is anything but boring. Turns out that this study was published to try to sort through the impact of various different government safety regulations uh, on automobile manufacturers. The requirement that auto companies put in lap belts, shoulder belts, collapsible steering columns, padded dashboards, safety glass for the windshields. The question that Peltzman wanted to know was all of these things are expensive. You're requiring manufacturers to put them in and ultimately consumers to pay for them. Have they saved lives? Do they justify the cost? And he analyzed the data across all of these various different safety improvements, and what he found was absolutely shocking. He found that there were no improved safety outcomes. That is, it didn't save lives. Now, that's not quite true. He found that in some cases, the number of auto occupant accident deaths did decline. But in those cases, he found that the number of pedestrian deaths actually increased to offset the gains from the safety that auto occupants uh, uh, experienced. And so what he argued was that when you put these safety devices in cars, people drove more recklessly because they felt safer. He argued that if you wanted people to drive more safely, what you should in fact be doing is installing sharp spikes pointed at the driver on the dashboards of the cars, and that will get them to drive very safely. Now, since that publication, many people have challenged the uh, findings. They've said that he didn't control for the nature of the kind of driving. Was it on the highway? Was it on country roads? Were people on vacation? Were they driving ambulances to various different uh, uh, hospitals? So in some of the studies that have subsequently been done where they control for these events, they did find the same results, but in other studies, they did not. And it wasn't until 2007 when a couple of economists did a study that controlled for all of these effects. In other words, they found a natural experiment where all of these various different confounding characteristics were controlled for, and the only thing that mattered was getting to your destination a little bit sooner. In that context, they reproduced the same kind of adaptive result that Peltzman came up with. And you know what that context was? You probably can guess. That context was NASCAR. It turns out that NASCAR experiences this in a very real way, that in most cases, when a safety innovation is introduced into these NASCAR cars, what happens is that the number of deaths actually increases. The number of accidents goes up. Because if you know that your car is capable of being pushed a little bit harder, believe me, as a NASCAR race driver, you will push that car to its limits and even beyond. And so this is clearly an example that risk perception and adaptive behavior actually are real. Now, what does this have to do with finance? Well, let me give you one simple implication of what's going on today. You probably know that we're currently in a relatively low volatility environment right now. At least that's what it looks like. Here's a plot 
of the VIX index. VIX is an index that measures the current market assessment for volatility that's implied by uh, options on the S&P 500 stock market index. And the VIX gives you a sense of whether or not volatility is high or low. Currently, the VIX index hovers between 10 and 11. And what that's saying is that volatility is really about half of what the stock market volatility has been historically. And what's amazing about this current graph is that we are at near record lows for volatility. Now, that might sound like, gee, this is great. The stock market has lower volatility. We should be able to take more risk. But the problem is that this graph may be quite misleading. It might get people to think that volatility is relatively low, and so they'll adapt to that by taking on greater risk when, in fact, volatility hasn't changed all that much. It's that certain patterns in market trading have artificially reduced that volatility level. So this could mean that if we adapt to this 10 or 11 percent volatility, we're actually putting ourselves in greater danger than we otherwise would be comfortable doing. Now, this brings me to the role of automation and algorithmic trading uh, and artificial intelligence. So I want to talk a bit about that because this figures very prominently in this idea of adaptive markets. I'm sure that all of you are familiar with this terrible, terrible feature of online shopping sites like Amazon, where when you buy one thing, they show you three or four things that people bought when they bought the item you were interested in. I experienced this recently when I bought the following book on Amazon. It was a book about Genentech. I've been getting more and more interested in biotech recently. So I decided to order this book, and as soon as I clicked on, on putting it in my basket, sure enough, Amazon said, customers who bought this book also bought these other five. And not surprisingly, I looked at them, and yes, Indeed, I was interested in two out of the five, so I actually ended up buying three books, not one of them. This is a terribly devious and effective way that online shoppers have for figuring out what it is you want and helping you to find it. This particular approach is actually pretty different from how artificial intelligence was being developed 20 or 30 years ago. Those of you who are old enough and were involved in AI back in the 1980s and 90s, you probably remember this idea of an expert system. And the idea behind an expert system was that it would actually encode all of the various different kinds of expertise for a particular decision-making problem so that they can automate that process. That process is very different from the way that these artificial intelligence algorithms work today, which is using machine learning techniques. And let me explain to you the difference this way. In the old days, when storage space, hard disk space, random access memory was expensive, it was really important for you to write relatively compact code that was incredibly efficient in terms of coming up with various different rules. So we didn't use a lot of data because we didn't have a lot of data, we couldn't store it, it was very expensive. So we had to anticipate all of the various possible outcomes in code. So the kind of artificial intelligence programs that were written in the 80s and 90s was actually quite long. The code was very complex. It had lots of different use cases and it would be a very long sequence of if-then statements to figure out what a particular instance was and whether or not it matched the particular case that this code was trying to capture. That's the way we used to do things. But now that we've got incredibly cheap storage, the kind of artificial intelligence that is used today relies on big data and relatively simple code. So by big data, I mean rather than coming up with all of the various possible use cases and anticipating them, let's just look at the history of the data that people have actually generated, like all of the people who bought the book Genentech, and see what other books they bought and show them to the users because that kind of very simple algorithm using large amounts of data can actually produce really amazing outcomes. And all of you, I'm sure, have heard of stories of big data having tremendous impact in being able to make predictions. And that's the key behind artificial intelligence today. It's using big data and machine learning techniques to come up with predictions or narratives, like if you pick this, then you will pick that. And it turns out that this actually is closer to natural intelligence 
than all of the previous methods that have been used. In fact, it's how the brain works. Before machine learning, there was human learning, and it's very much the same. So I want to give you an example of that, and the example I'm going to give has to do with threat detection. That's a key task of human cognition. It's to try to identify friend versus foe, and I'm going to do that with regard to vision. Imagine you're looking at this scene. What do you think that is? Can anybody tell me? Now, unfortunately, we can't interact here, but I've asked many of my students, and they say, oh, this is a, a pretty blob of various different colored squares. It's an abstract art. Well, actually, it is a picture, but it's a picture that's been pixelated. I haven't given you that many different pixels so that you can distinguish. So here's a picture with more pixels. Is this starting to look like something? Now, if I give you even more pixels, you can actually see exactly what it is. This is a picture of yours truly uh, being stalked by a ninja. Now, actually, I'm not really being stalked by a ninja. This was taken at the Washington, D.C. Spy Museum. It's a selfie. And I know by looking at this high-definition picture that I have nothing to fear because that's not a real ninja, and that's why I'm smiling. Cognition is incredibly important, and in particular, resolution, being able to see the richness of our environment and identifying threats or not is a key aspect of our cognitive functions. Now, it turns out that humans have developed many other inputs for threat detection. So let me give you an example of that. Imagine you're at a cocktail party making conversation with various different participants, and over the course of a five or ten minute conversation, you go through a variety of different bits of information uh, of the person you're talking to. You might ask about their gender and sexual orientation, a race, ethnicity, age, current home state, and so on and so forth. And I've just listed each of these characteristics and the number of possible choices, just to keep it simple, uh, that you might encounter in a casual conversation. So for gender and sexual orientation, you can be straight or gay, you can be uh, male or female, so there are four different possibilities. For race, race, ethnicity, I've grouped it into roughly four categories, four age groups, 50 different states, four different religious affiliations, and so on. And given that these are the characteristics that might come through in a typical cocktail conversation, let me give you an example of a couple of the individuals that you're likely to meet. So I'd like to introduce you to Jose. Jose happens to be a gay Latino male. He's a young professional from California with no religious affiliation, but he's a Democrat, middle class, and got his MBA. So that's Jose. And now I'd like to introduce you to somebody else that you might have met at that same cocktail party. Her name is Julia. Julia is a heterosexual female, white, middle-aged from Texas, Christian, Republican, rather affluent, and has a bachelor's degree. Now I'm going to ask you a few questions about these two individuals, and I want you to just answer for yourself what you think. Which one of these two individuals is more likely to be working at a, a technology startup? Well, when I ask that question, most people say, Jose. And then let me ask you, um, which of these individuals is most likely to be involved in putting together a fundraising dinner for a particular political candidate? And most people will say, well, that really looks like Julia. And then I'll ask, well, um, which one of these two individuals is more likely to be cheating on his or her tax returns? Again, most people say, Julia. And if I then ask, which one of these individuals is most likely to be a rabble rouser, likely to foment some kind of a, a strike at a, a workers' uh, union meeting? Most people would say, well, that really sounds like Jose. And you know, after I go through these examples, I point out to the audience, wow, you guys are just incredibly judgmental because you haven't met these people. I've just told you a few simple facts about them, and you're already making predictions. Well, you know what? This is what we do. This is what the human cognitive faculties do. I'm not saying it's good or bad. I'm simply telling you that this is how we, as a human learning machine, behave. It's because when we go through all the various different possibilities of these characteristics, do you know how many different pixels there are in this picture? Well, if you do the math, it turns out that 
there are 345,600 possible unique types across these various different characteristics. That's more pixels than an 800 by 600 photo. And now, when we start meeting people and trying to identify friend or foe, what we do, in many cases completely unconsciously, is we ask all of these questions and we fill out the forms of where people lie in this big, big data matrix. And then we take a look in our history and ask the question of the various different characteristics that are of the particular type that we've identified, how have they behaved, and we will use their behavior as data for making predictions in the exact same way that Amazon will use its database to tell me what books I might like to buy, even though it, they have no idea who I am. The problem with this, it works very well in certain cases, but the problem is that you can imagine the data that gets generated by this algorithm is very, very sparse. Of the 345,600 possible individuals with these different characteristics, how many of them have you met? My guess is a very small fraction. And yet, even with that small fraction of data, you will make inferences, you will make predictions, you will make judgments. This is the origin of all of the biases that we engage in. Racial bias, gender bias, religious bias, all of these are part of the human cognitive process. Again, I'm not justifying any of these things. I'm trying to explain why they exist and why it is that it's so important for us to worry about the impact of data on our cognitive processes. This is one of the reasons that fake news is actually problematic. It's because when we generate outcomes and store them in our database, we will draw on those outcomes in order to make predictions. So if we get fake news and we take that as real, we incorporate that into our decision-making process, that could be problematic. I discovered this in a rather humorous way uh, a few years ago when I was on vacation with my wife and children, and uh, we were at a hotel, and I had my laptop with me, but nobody else had any of their electronic devices. So my wife decided to do some online shopping with, um, with, my, uh, with my laptop. I come back from vacation on Monday morning, and I fire up my laptop, and I pull up the Wall Street Journal, and you know where they have these boxes of ads that are targeted just at you? All of a sudden, I see ads for women's underwear uh, on, my, on my browser, and I immediately had to shut it down because I did not want my assistant to come in and think I was now uh, surfing the Internet for, for porn. Uh, but that's an example where sometimes these algorithms are a little too smart. They engage in unintended consequences. That happens all the time with human cognition, and we have to worry about that. We have to guard against that. So. I want to conclude with one last uh, uh, story about what adaptive markets involves, and that has to do with the fact that we use all of these methods for learning from big data and using this kind of algorithm to come up with predictions in the form of narrative. In other words, we don't just store data, we store explanations, stories. And we use these explanations and stories to make predictions. And if we have the right story, we are capable of doing amazing, amazing things. So the example that I draw upon in my book is the story of a hiker named Aaron Lee Ralston, who on April the 26th of 2003 was hiking in a beautiful but remote region of Utah called Blue John Canyon. He slipped and fell into a crevasse and an 800-pound boulder fell on top of him and pinned his right arm against the rock wall. He was stuck there for about five days with very little food and water, just what he brought with him in his backpack, and no way to communicate. And this was in an area that was completely unpopulated. Nobody was expecting him, so there was no way for him to get out of that spot. And you may have heard about this particular hiker because he wrote a book about it, and a movie was made about him called 127 Hours. That's how long he was stuck. Finally, he got free because he decided to amputate his right arm right in the middle of the forearm using a rather dull multi-tool knife after being stuck for 127 hours. He was trapped for five days.
And the question that I had in my mind was, how did he come about that decision? How do you get somebody to do something so extraordinarily painful? It has to do with narrative. So the narrative that Aaron Lee Ralston came up with was this. A blonde three-year-old boy in a red polo shirt comes running across a sunlit hardwood floor in what I somehow know is my future home. By the same intuitive perception, I know the boy is my own. I bend to scoop him into my left arm, using my handless right arm to balance him. And we laugh together as I swing him up to my shoulder. Then, with a shock, the vision blinks out. I'm back in the canyon, echoes of his joyful sounds resonating in my mind, creating a subconscious reassurance that somehow I will survive this entrapment. Despite having already come to accept that I will die where I stand before help arrives, now I believe I will live. That belief, that boy, changes everything for me. Now, what Aaron Lee Ralston was referring to was a narrative that he had imagined in that canyon in 2003. And what's amazing about the story is that in 2003, Aaron Lee Ralston was not married, had no children. In fact, he, he wouldn't get married until six, year later, six years later in 2009. And in 2010, he did give birth, his wife and he had a child, uh, Leo, pictured here. What's amazing about the story is that we are capable of amazing things if we have the right narrative, this is evolution at the speed of thought. We can change our behavior not one generation at a time. We can change it one narrative at a time. We need new narratives in finance. The adaptive markets hypothesis is a new narrative about finance, but within the financial industry, particularly given the financial crisis, we need to have newer, better narratives. There's no doubt that there was a lot of bad behavior and misappropriation of financial tools in the industry, but finance is also a means to many very positive ends. And in the last chapter of my book, I talk about a different perspective on finance, the, the, the future of finance and the finance of the future. Finance doesn't have to be a zero-sum game if we don't let it. So the adaptive market hypothesis really tries to bring all of these ideas together. It, it focuses on the fact that investors, managers, regulators, policymakers are neither rational or irrational, they're human. They innovate, they compete, they adapt, they reproduce, and they evolve even within a generation through these heuristics. And so if we want to understand why they behave the way they behave, instead of railing against their behaviors, we ought to look deeper into the underlying mechanisms the kind of machine learning algorithms that the human machine uses in order to come up with its decisions. And this is where quantitative models and tools can be helpful in capturing those dynamics, but they too have to evolve. And using this framework of, of adaptive markets, we can get a better handle on just how to do that. So I want to thank all of you for participating today and joining me and allowing me to come into your homes and offices. For more on the adaptive markets hypothesis, I've uh, given a, a lecture that you can find online uh, at this URL uh, at MIT. A few years ago, I gave some more technical uh, presentations about these ideas at Oxford University. Those are the Clarendon lectures. And then, of course, you can find all of my research on my website. And please feel free to follow me on Twitter. And please send me your feedback about how you think this uh, format has worked. So let me stop here, turn it back to uh, Betsy, and uh, happy to take questions from uh, the uh, participants. Thank you, Professor Lowe. This has been incredibly fascinating. We're, we're looking forward to getting to uh, the questions. As a reminder, please type in your questions in the Q&A box on the right side of your screen. Please take a moment to make sure that you have selected all panelists before submitting your question. While you're doing that, I'm just going to take a quick moment to tell you about some of our upcoming MIT Sloan Alumni Online events. On September 28th, Professor Thomas Malone will join us to discuss creating more intelligent organizations. Then in October, Christina Chi from the class of 2013 will be speaking about entrepreneurship after MIT, how to utilize your alma mater to succeed.
You can register for these virtual events on the MIT Sloan Alumni Online website or stay tuned uh, for future communications from our team with details. Just quickly, I would also like to remind you about upcoming in-person mm -hmm. events. We hope you're able to attend. Please visit our MIT Sloan Alumni Events website for summer events that may be happening near you, including a number of summer gatherings in California and Boston. MIT Sloan's A Better World is Our Business events will be traveling the globe this fall and will take place in Sao Paulo in September, in Singapore in October, and in London in December. Details for these, those events can be found on our events website under the campaign events. So now let's move on to questions. We would like to start today's Q&A with some spotlight questions that were submitted during the registration process. Our first question comes from Carles Ibora, MBA 2001 in Barcelona, Spain. Carles asks, do you believe that in light of your conclusions, both active and passive investment should be combined, or do you favor only one of those styles? Well, Carlos, thanks very much for that question. I would say, yes, the answer is both active and passive investments should be combined, but I'll go one step farther and say that the very idea of active and passive investing is changing. So, for example, the old days of passive investing would involve putting your money in a market cap weighted index fund like the S&P 500. But that was because we didn't have the ability to manage the portfolio in a more dynamic way. What you're seeing happening today with all of these various different methods for algorithmic trading is that we can come up with passive investments that are much more sophisticated than simply market cap weighting. You know, a simple example is a 130-30 portfolio uh, or a target date portfolio. These are examples of investments that don't require any kind of alpha or investment expertise, but they're managed much more dynamically. So I would say that, yes, both active and passive investments ought to be combined, but that the idea behind active and passive investments are changing as well, and we ought to embrace those changes, make sure we understand them, and be able to take advantage of them if they're appropriate for our particular investment objectives. Thank you. Our next spotlight question is from George Nicolas Panoyatu, SM 1985 in Ekali, Greece. He asks, have you tested your model using econometrics or other tools? How robust are the results and what is their predictive ability? Yeah, that's a great question, George. Thank you for asking. We're just starting to do that now. For example, one of the areas that we're doing most of the testing and where I first really got the idea behind adaptive markets was looking at the properties of hedge funds. Hedge funds, as I write in my book, is the Galapagos Islands of the financial industry in the sense that you can see evolution happening before your very eyes. And so if you look at the data for hedge fund returns and you see how statistically they change over time as a function of market conditions, you can actually start seeing evolution happening and documenting various aspects of the adaptive markets hypothesis. So this is a good example of how the adaptive markets framework differs from efficient markets. Efficient markets would say it's impossible to beat the market. Don't bother trying. Hedge funds can't possibly exist. The fact is they do exist, and hedge funds in the past have outperformed the market, but they're not doing so right now. They ebb and flow, they wax and wane as a function of market conditions. So we're just starting to take econometric tools and statistical analysis to the data, um, and it's really a very interesting experiment because at every step of the way, we're seeing that the adaptive market hypothesis does offer some greater predictive power than a traditional framework, but we're still in the early days and there's a lot more work to be done, which is one of the reasons why I wrote the book. I wanted to get my colleagues to start working with me to testing these ideas. Great, thank you. Our last Spotlight question is from Ramil Maharamov, MBA 2016 in Baku, Azerbaijan. Ramil is wondering, will humanity ever learn to avoid excesses and bubbles and overcome greed? Well, Ramil, thank you for that question. You know, I've asked that myself on many occasions, especially when I end up engaging in some of these activities. And, you know, the way to think about it is the fact that human behavior has evolved over what well, millions of years if you take other species into account, but with regard to Homo sapiens, we've been around in our current forms for maybe a couple of hundred thousand years, but really it's only in the past 60,000 years that we've started engaging in the kind of thought processes that we do now. And so what that means is that the kind of decision-making apparatus that we have, 
really came out of the Neolithic Ice Age, and that's sort of what we're set up for. We're not used to dealing with the challenges of the New York Stock Exchange because we're really looking for the flora and fauna of the African savanna. Uh, and so that suggests that the kind of issues that we're grappling with, this greed and fear, is going to be with us for quite some time. Now, eventually, maybe after tens, if not hundreds of thousands of years of evolution, we will learn and adapt to these new kinds of market conditions. But probably for the next uh, several hundred or thousand years, we're going to be living with booms and busts, and we're going to have to deal with that. So the good news, of course, is that we can develop tools to help us through those kinds of situations. But from a purely emotional and human cognitive uh, perspective, I think we're going to be subject to these booms and busts for a very long time. Thank you, Professor Lowe. Let's um, move on to some of the live questions from our viewers that are coming in. Um, Renee Gonzalez um, sends you a big hello, um, and she also says, um, given that much of today's trading is done via automated systems, presumably systems that exclude human bias, how do you think that these trading systems impact volatility of the stock market? Is it a stabilizing factor? Yeah, hi, Renee. Thank you very much for participating and for asking that question. You know, it's a mixed bag, and it has to do with the fact that the ecosystem now is much more complicated than before. So let me give you an example that will provide one answer to your question and then turn it around and give you yet another answer. So it used to be the case that as part of the hedge fund industry's activities in the uh, equity markets, mean reversion was a very popular kind of a strategy. So mean reversion is a strategy where you're buying losers and you're selling winners because you're betting on the reversals uh, of these particular market prices. And so when you buy a stock that's come down, you're expecting that it's going to reverse because it probably went down too far and it will eventually come back. So mean reversion was an example of a trading strategy that actually reduced volatility. And you can see why. It's because if a stock price is going down, if people think that the value of the company is not very high and it ought to go lower, then the behavior of these mean reversion traders is to buy those downward spiraling prices. They provide a kind of a support level for that. And similarly, when prices are going up and you're expecting it to reverse, you're going to start selling. As the prices are going up, you're going to be pushing prices back down. So mean reversion trading actually forces prices into a narrower range than if you left them alone. And so you could argue that having that kind of an algorithm will actually cause uh, the volatility to be dampened. Well, now we've got momentum trading, uh, the kind of trend following strategies that futures traders often like to do. Trend following is where you're selling the losers and you're buying the winners. You're actually pushing prices farther in the direction that they're currently going. So that would tend to increase volatility. So question, which is stronger, the mean reversion folks or the trend following folks? The answer is it depends. It depends on how these strategies have done over the last few years and how much money is pouring into them. So instead of being able to come up with a single answer, uh, an ecologist looking at this kind of an ecosystem would say, you know what, we've got to measure the flora and fauna of the ecosystem. How many mean reversion traders do you have? How much money do they have? How active are they? And the same thing for trend followers and for all of the various other kinds of traders in the marketplace. So the adaptive market hypothesis doesn't give you a single answer, but it gives you a framework for being able to answer that question in the same way that you can answer a question about whether or not one or two species will dominate in a given biological ecosystem. Thank you. Um, our next question comes in from Taimur Kitty, um, and the question is, are there any other applications of adaptive market hypothesis, perhaps in the field of strategy? Well, Taimur, I have to say that uh, to somebody with a hammer, everything looks like a nail. So I think that adaptive markets can be applied to all sorts of different applications. Uh, and I, I believe that sincerely, not because of my brilliance, uh, quite the contrary. The idea behind adaptive markets is not new. It really relies on the theory of evolution, which, as you know, came from Darwin and many of the other biologists. But in particular, a number of the recent evolutionary biologists like E.O. Wilson, who has championed the application of these methods to sociological and cultural contexts, I think that's what you're looking for. And I think absolutely that can be done. In other words, you could think about cultures evolving over time. 
And you can identify the different species within those cultures and try to understand the nature of that evolutionary dynamic. And that's really where strategy comes in. In fact, I think a number of the large management consulting firms are using these kinds of evolutionary principles to think about how to change culture and how to identify the potential problems that cultures might run into when they're faced with these environmental shocks. So I would encourage you not only to read my book, but to, uh, other books that are written by these evolutionary biologists, particularly E.O. Wilson. He's a, an extraordinary writer, and he can give you some uh, uh, specific applications of these kinds of uh, ideas to areas outside of traditional finance or economics. Thank you. I think we have time for just one more question, um, and this one comes in from James Burdell, and James asks, what is the best way to encourage and accelerate adaptive behavior in finance? Well, James, that's a great question to end on. What I've been trying to do is to get people to understand, first of all, what the framework is. Because I think up until recently, many people, particularly in the academic finance community, thought of financial markets more as a physical system rather than a biological one. And you know, we all, myself included, have physics envy. You know, we'd love to have three laws that explain 99% of all behavior. But I think it was Richard Feynman who said, you know, imagine how much harder physics would be if electrons had feelings. And I think that's a, a very good description of the limitations that we face when dealing with uh, financial markets. So I think the best way to get individuals to start thinking adaptively is to first explain to them how we got here to begin with and what role adaptation has played. That's what I tried to do in my book, I, and that's one of the reasons why it's 500 pages long. It really brings you through a various series of arguments and, and stories. M most of them are, are anecdotes uh, that really explain to you why it is the case that we are where we are, how we got here, how the financial crisis happened, and what we can do about it if we understand the evolutionary mechanisms. So I'm hoping that the book will actually provide that kind of a framework. And uh, again, thank you all for allowing me to participate uh, in this wonderful event. And uh, please uh, do send me your feedback. Love to hear from you. Professor Lowe, we can't thank you enough for such an engaging conversation today. It's been a real pleasure for us to host this event. We also want to thank all of our Sloan alumni and friends for joining us today. We hope you're able to join us for our future MIT Sloan alumni online events, which are made possible in part by the Sloan Annual Fund. As today's event comes to a close, we hope you will take a moment to complete the brief survey that will automatically pop up on your screen. This will help us to continue to create programming that will be meaningful to you. Thank you so much for joining MIT Sloan Alumni Online.